The scripture today actually is sort of a follow-up uh, on Jeremiah from two or three weeks ago when I preached on the passage. You will recall that Jeremiah's country of Judah was being threatened by the Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans. In the midst of the certainty that like grasshoppers, like locusts, the Babylonians were going to go and devour Judah, in the midst of that certainty, Jeremiah makes a real estate investment. So I want you, as you hear this scripture read, to ponder the question, why in the world is he doing this? Hear now this reading from Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on the scales. I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of all the witnesses. In their presence, I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. For thus says the Lord, Just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good fortune that I now promise them. Fields shall be bought in the land of which you are saying, It is a desolation, without human beings or animals. It has been given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Fields shall be bought for money, and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin, in the places around Jerusalem, and in the city of Judah, in the, of the hill country, of the Shephelah, and of the Nagad. For I will restore their fortunes, says the Lord. Only to people whom we have a lot of confidence in would we give a scripture passage with Shephaliah, Neriah, Anathoth. So, <laughs> let us pray. Lord God, would you please be present in these words so that the spirit of the living Christ will be honored. Amen. I have, as you might uh, say, made some interesting financial investments in my lifetime. Back in the 90s, I invested in Ben & Jerry's ice cream. I love Chunky Monkey and Cherry Garcia. I figured this is an opportunity. It only has to go up. I bought it at $31 a share, the highest it had ever been. <laughs> the next week, they had a managerial shakeup, and it went down to $12 a share, where I sold it. I guess you could say it had a meltdown. <laughs> Ice cream. A few years later, I invested in a company that was uh, the, a backbone internet infrastructure company called Exodus. I read about it. Besides, it had a biblical name. I thought I should invest in it. That was in 2000. About a month or two later, the tech bubble burst, and Exodus, like its name, left the business world. <laughs> totally. I say all this to say, I have a de facto investing philosophy of buy high, sell low. <laughs> if you would like to make money, just ask what I invest in and don't do it, and you will be good. And I say all this to say this, even I, an investment-challenged person like myself, would never do what Jeremiah did. It was obvious that the a land of Judah was going to be decimated. Uh, it would be the equivalent of the banking system and the stock market going uh, catatonic, going flatline, right? And with that in mind, Jeremiah takes 17 shekels of silver, a pretty good amount, and he buys property. He buys land. 
Do you think the Babylonians, once they invade and decimate the country, will be, uh, will be honoring him when he says, but you, wait, you can't take my land. I have a deed. No. So why did he do it? The answer is found if you excavate a little verse uh, in the middle of what uh, you heard Abby read to you today. Verse that goes like this. Take these deeds of the land, put them in an earthenware jar. Earthenware jar is like a safe deposit box, uh, the ancient equivalent thereof. The Dead Sea Scrolls found a few decades ago were contained in an earthenware jar, safe and uh, sound after almost 2,000 years. That's what Jeremiah had in mind, that they may last for a long time, a long time. You see, what Jeremiah knew was this, that he should not follow my investing philosophy of buy high, sell low, but rather you should follow God's investing philosophy, namely invest, wait, and believe. Because Jeremiah knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was doing something, that God was at work. And regardless of what it looked like with the Babylonians on the horizon, God was the one in control. God was still the big person on the block, not the Babylonians. And God had plans that would not ever be derailed or detoured or delayed. And so what he did was with joy, he goes down to the realtor. With joy, he, he uh, invests in this land and puts these, with joy. And don't you know that all the other people around were inspired by that after they once understood that he wasn't crazy? Because he was doing this as a witness to them, saying, yes, the Babylonians are here, but God also is here. And what God will do is amazing, is jaw-dropping, is awesome. I guess you could say Jeremiah's lesson is this. The ultimate act of faith that leads to the ultimate joy and underlying joy, the ultimate joy of life is this, investing in work that God is in charge of, not us. Investing in work that God is in charge of, not us. Andy made reference to the work that we have been uh, diligently pursuing for the last couple of years, contained in uh, this very slick uh, brochure that we have, and many are many of these uh, copies of these are available in the Welcome Center, that portray what we believe with all of our hearts are God's dreams in the next few years. Things that are ultimately important for God to do in these next few years. This document was produced out of a lot of prayer, out of a lot of discernment, conversation, and it evolved in just as much clarity and a firm foundation as Jeremiah's vision of what God was going to be doing came to him. God has dreams that there will be through this congregation a, a break in the cycle of poverty that bankrupts in many ways people's lives. God has dreams that there will be a concerted outreach to a generation that continually and increasingly sees Christianity in the church as totally irrelevant. God has dreams that through uh, this congregation, there will be other congregations in partnership with us to be able to change the direction of ministries, shared ministries, in a more positive direction. God has dreams that people that come through the doors of this church will be changed in many, many ways. God has dreams. And the joy that you have is not to invest in something that is at the whim of Ben and Jerry's management, that is not at the whim of a stock market that's extremely timid and fragile, but the joy of life, the ultimate joy of life, is to invest in something that you know God is in charge of and will not be delayed in accomplishing. I think the ultimate investing philosophy that we must follow, if we're going to have joy in our life, and by investing, I don't mean just money. I mean the resources that we've been graced with, our time and our talent, as well as our treasure. The ultimate joy comes from when, we when we give with this philosophy. WWGD, what will God do? And if I could redo that slide, I would have put will in capital letters. What will God do? And that's the joy. Because when you give, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. All you know is that God's going to do something 
the likes of which this world has never seen before, the likes of which we have never seen before. There is a, I, I love the story told uh, of a young boy, 11 years old, being raised by a single mom on a farm. In the farm next door, there's a, a horse. Uh, Mr. Raker had the farm, and there's a horse named Lady, and this boy had uh, uh, developed a relationship with this horse. He, he would ride her on the uh, down the pasture, imagining himself to be a cowboy, imagining himself to be a knight, what have you. They just enjoyed it, you know, uh, a boy and a horse. And the horse was for sale, $1,500. And it was okay for the mom, boy's mom, to buy the horse, except for the fact that even though she had $1,500, it was for braces, not for a horse. The boy understood money was tight. So instead of spending a summer riding the horse, he spent the summer going to the orthodontist. A little, almost as much fun as riding a horse, but not quite. Well, one afternoon, Mr. Raker pulls up in his truck with a trailer in tow, and he gets out, being the old horse trader he is, and goes up to the boy and says, Son, how much money you got saved? Boy, did quick accounting, $17, he stammered out. Hmm, isn't that interesting? That's exactly how much I want for this, this mare and trailer. In a matter of minutes, the transaction was complete, and the boy was riding Lady out in the pasture. And no one ever knew exactly why Mr. Raker, this old horse trader literally, did that except for what he said. I never have felt this way for years. I've never felt this way for years. Now, he never knew how much what he did would affect that boy, because for the rest of his life, that boy would remember the sight of that truck and trailer pulled up in front of his house. He would always remember that extravagantly generous offer that Mr. Raker did, and that boy would become a, a, a special man because of that, a generous man himself. Mr. Raker would not know that, but all he knew, Mr. Raker knew, was, I haven't felt this way in years. When you give to the work that God has in mind, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. You don't know the face of that young person who will attend the second sight worship that we're going to be doing, who will be turned to Christ because of that second sight worship. You might not know the face of the family that will be in a relationship with the family here in this church, a family uh, in the Kingdom House or Shalom House area, but because of that relationship that family and the family from this church will have new life and will, will form a close bond. You might not know the faces yet. You might not know the faces of uh, that congregation will be in partnership with as we share our resources with them and they with us and we both grow stronger. We might not know the faces of children and of youth and adults who will come into the walls of this church and see a different type of worship experience or see expanded faith formation activities or mission work or fellowship opportunities. You might not know the faces right now, but what you do know is this. When you invest in God's work with your resources, God is going to make that happen. Lives will be changed and jaws will drop at what God will do. And that is the greatest joy you can ever have. Jeremiah put in 17 shekels of silver as his investment in what will God do? What will God do? What will you put in? This is the week of discernment. We've worked hard and seen, uh, of course, all of our resources that we can give with joy to God. But what about our financial? What is your 17 shekels of silver, if you will? It's important to really be honest with yourself and to see it. The, the traditional model is that of a tithe, an old word that means 10, 10 percent, giving 10 percent of your income annually to God. And our bishop has a very good definition of this. He said that the tithe is enough to allow people of nearly any income to meet without imposing great hardship, and yet it's large enough 
to stretch us and to cause us to do the necessary reordering of our priorities that spiritually reconfigures our values. I like that. The practice of tithing is not merely about what God wants us to do, but about the kind of person God wants us to become. Does the giving I now practice help me develop a Christ-like heart? Good question. Many of you practice tithing. My family and I practice tithing. But remember, it's more than simply a goal. It's being intentional about what we can give to God for God to do extravagantly with. It is meant to be intentional. I think it is the duty of every Christian every Christian, to be able to know how much of my income am I giving back to God joyfully. You know how much you receive. What percentage is it that you can give back? Is it 10%? Great. Is it not 10%? How can you possibly move at least incrementally to it? Because the importance is this. You pay the bank for the mortgage. That's non-negotiable, right? You pay the bank for your car loan. That's non-negotiable. But so often we say, well, what we give back to God, well, that's negotiable. You know, it's sort of like an EKG. Well, that's fine. Oh, no, I can't do that. You don't do that with the other priorities you have. What is your priority to be able to invest in what will not necessarily benefit you, but will benefit and be life-changing for others? Because ultimately, it's not about the church is asking for money again. No. It's your heart is asking for joy, and here's how you receive it. Not joy as the world gives, but joy as God can give when you see what God is doing. It's called the expansion of the heart. We do a lot of baptism in this church, and it's great. I think probably 35 to 45 a year at last count, at least of infant baptisms, Well, it wasn't in this church that this happened, but in another church that probably did many baptisms, on one service, there were two families where their infants were being baptized. After the service, while they were posing for pictures, one grandfather was asked to hold the baby of the other family while people were getting ready for the pictures. And as this grandfather held the, the child of this other family, a couple of people would come up and say, well, what a pretty grandson you have. And the person would say, or the grandfather would say, well, it's not exactly my grand, grandson, it's that other family's. This was on a Sunday. The next day, Monday, the man stops by the pastor's office and says, I want to change my will to include the church in my estate. As an aside, pastors love conversations like this. So. <laughs> My direct line is 636-200-4703, just if you want to have that. That was an aside. Well, the pastor asked, well, why do you want to do that? What what moved you to do this? And here's what, here are the exact words of that uh, gentleman. Yesterday, I realized something while I was holding that other baby. I kept telling people that he wasn't my child, but then it dawned on me that he was part of my family part of my church family, and I've been a member of this church for more than 40 years, and in God's eyes, I'm a grandfather to more than just my own. I've taken care of my own children with my will, but I realized I also need to provide for the children of the church. So I want to divide my estate to leave a part to the church as if the church were one of my children. You see, like Jeremiah, he caught a vision. He might not know exactly what God was going to do or how God was going to do it, but he knew God was active. God was working. And as he left that pastor's office, he must have had a large smile on his face. And he too, like Mr. Raker, must have said to himself, this is the best I have felt in years. Next weekend when we dedicate our pledges, may you and I be able to say, the same. Let us pray. O God of us all, your love never ends and your generosity never ends. May each man, woman, youth, and child today catch a glimpse of your amazing vision and with joy say, I want to be a part of it because I just can't wait to see 
what you're going to do next. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Amen.